So Beth, I'm so grateful you're zooming in with us today. I only wish you were here in person and after all these planning talks with you, I know that we have to get you back down here to Kentucky for an in-person workshop, maybe a whole day because you have so much to share with us. Um, Beth is an associate professor of cooperative education at Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio, where she teaches a series of reskilling and resilience courses exploring seed resilience, plant medicine, regenerative agriculture, food preservation, and commensality. Beth directs cooperative extension partnerships and sustainability, environmental and biomedical science and alternative education. Her current research project, Pedagogies of Nature, Shinto, Spiritual Ecology, and Traditional Ecological Knowledge, received national endowment for the arts funding through the Great Lakes College Association. Beth, welcome, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Do we have a poll at the beginning? Yeah, we're going to throw a poll up for uh, yeah. attendees. There you go. So if you all can take if you all can take a minute to reply to that, we'll share the results with you. That's wonderful. I'll I'll go ahead and start while we're looking at that. Um, okay, it looks like. Hi, I got muted there for a second. Are we um, are we done with our poll here, Brooke? Yes, those are the results you're seeing there, Beth. That's wonderful. It looks like we have um, about half the folks here who are maybe beginning seed savers. You have a little bit of experience, um, but you'd like to learn more. And some folks who are hobby seed savers and save all I can. So and and then um, some who are interested. So. This looks wonderful. And we have one person who's a master seed saver who can teach this. So that's wonderful. Great. And I just wanna share, um, if folks need to close that, just X that poll and it'll disappear for you. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can get started here. There we go. So welcome everybody. I am um, I'm happy to be here today. I've been thinking about uh, seeds a lot. I think a lot of us are getting ready to start our seeds indoors already. I, I love starting seeds. And um, if we had a chance to be in person, I'd, I'd ask you all to raise your hands and see how many of you are getting ready to start some seeds already. I've sorted my seeds. I've gotten them out of my fridge and um, sorted them into, you know, two month piles, one month piles, um, things I need to start three months ahead of time. So here we are. And I'd like to uh, just acknowledge right now that I uh, started on my seed saving journey with Bill McDormand from the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. And he's just an amazing man. He has just stepped down. Uh, he's still working full time for Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, but they have a new executive director. And I took my first um, train the trainer course with him in 2014 here at Antioch College. They came and did a seven day seed school for us. And all of those folks who attended, there were 21 of us, um, we committed to getting the word out about seed saving. And that's what I've done since 2014 is you know, numerous workshops, um, working closely with Extension. I, my former um, career was with OSU Extension here in Ohio. And so I'm just looking forward to sharing with you all today. And the, what I'm sharing today is usually um, done in at least a, sort of a four hour at the very minimum, um, up to like a week uh, sharing of seed school. So we're gonna really try to cram this in um, just as fast as we can here. So we'll save our questions for the end. And I also want you to know that I'll be happy to put my um, email address in at the end and you folks can reach out to me later if you have additional questions. Okay, so here we are and Here's, we're gonna to learn today how to save seeds a little bit and really importantly, why you should. And I would just like to talk a little bit about that at first. So the really important thing to know is that we cannot have food sovereignty unless we have seed sovereignty, unless we have control over our seeds. 
And, um, you know, we need to increase our genetic diversity in our seeds. Uh, we've lost a lot of resilience in our seeds um, over the years, a lot of diversity. We need to be taking back control over what we can grow. And, you know, we've learned about seed banks, and I'll talk about those in a little bit, but when we save seeds and we share seeds, then that's a living seed bank. It's live, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not frozen away somewhere. Um, it, it's just right, right where we need it to be. And then it's a lovely thing to save seeds. The community building that happens is just so much fun. Um, the last little thing on this first slide, this is a, and y'all can have a recording, if this is a great uh, little story, but it was about COVID and why it's important to save seeds is because this, this you know, this was a Sunday thing I used to talk about, and this just happened last spring, where there was a panic rush on seeds because of COVID. People didn't know what was going to be happening at the very time that most of those little seed companies were closed because of COVID. So we did not, for, for a moment there, we did not have access to seeds last spring. And it was a real wake-up call for why we all need to be saving seed and sharing it. And we're facing the same thing now. Again, if I could you know, just have a maybe a raise of hands or if anyone wanted to just um, say yes or no over in the chat box, how many of you have already reached out to try to buy your seeds and have already found a shortage already this year? Okay, 97%, um, then that's an estimate, but about 90% of all of our diversity um, in vegetables and flowers and some fruits has been lost since about 1900. 97% of our diversity is gone. And between 60 to 75% of the com world's commercial seed is now owned by three or four agrochemical companies. I used to give a more exact figure on this, but this is really, um, it is changing as we speak. And so um, I'll talk about that later on here. So I think it's important to know, people don't understand how important it is to be saving seeds. But it's also really important to know, to contextualize this, how did we get here and why does that matter? So I'm gonna start off this presentation by talking a little bit about the history of seed saving in the United States over about the last hundred years. So I'm gonna yeah, keep clicking that off so that you can see the slides a little bit. Um, there are kind of four different parts of um, contributions to what the germplasm is in the United States today. So we have our indigenous plants and our indigenous stewards who have been here all this time, um, moving our, our world forward with plants. And then there was the Columbian exchange. So, you know, and that, the, that term is based on Christopher Columbus when this massive travel started happening between Europe, you know, the, the, the colonization and all the seed that went back and forth during that time. And then we have plants from the enslaved diaspora, the African diaspora, and the seeds that they brought over. And you may have heard from Leah Penniman perhaps this morning, I was not able to attend, but how those enslaved folks on the ships, those women put, wove those seeds into their hair to bring over. Um, and that's how we got seeds from, from the African diaspora. And then plants from settlers and colonizers. So some of the indigenous plants that have always been here are, you know, we have berries, roots, nuts, persimmons, pawpaws. So I, you folks probably in Kentucky have a lot of pawpaws. Um, wild rice, ramps, etc. Those are some things that were here since the beginning. Um, these are things that went back and forth with the Columbian Exchange. This is just a tiny little sample. You know, dandelions were not here until the Columbian Exchange. Honey from honeybees, you know, uh, sugar cane, wheat, bananas, coffee, teas, yams, peanuts, potatoes are another one. Um, and then Plants from the uh, African diaspora include sorghum, flowering sesame, okra, cotton, black-eyed peas, also called cow peas, um, melons and squashes. So all those things are part of our germplasm here now in the United States. And again, the co colonial settlers, a lot of that was from the Col Columbia Exchange, the one I just mentioned. So let's just start with um, a little bit to talk about those seeds in the Columbian Exchange. In colonial times, um, you know, folks brought seeds with them from, from what they knew. And they came here and they recognized some things, they didn't recognize others, they misnamed some things um, that they thought, you know, looked something like similar to home. But they brought their seed with them from Europe. And mostly this was the wealthy landowners who were bringing the seed and trying to um, see how it did here. So they could afford to import seeds 
and they could afford to try to you know, adapt them to the new world's growing environment. And some of these included um, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, and they were huge agriculturalists. And this is a picture of Monticello. Um, you may know that Jefferson was always experimenting with new plants. And so um, they really wanted to bring over those seeds to see how they did here and to get them established here. And they wanted to give them out to folks to try because some things worked and some things didn't. And there was a lot of starvation in the beginning because people were unfamiliar with the foods that were here and the, and the foods or seeds that they had brought were not working. And so they were really trying a lot of different things, experimenting with a lot of different seeds. So in 1839, um, whoops, I'm gonna get rid of that for a second. There we go. The commissioner of patents, he was in the patent office, uh, Henry Ellsworth, and he secured funding to, for Congress to collect seed in one place and then to distribute it. And so that came out of the patent office and they were giving that seed out free to farmers. And of course we were, you know, a 95% agricultural society at that point. 10 years after it started, that patent office had sent out 60,000 packets of seeds through the US Postal Service. In 1855, just not so long later, they'd shipped out over a million seed packages. And these were going for far to farmers for free. This was out of the patent office. But just a few years later, there was a lot happening, a lot of different, um, activity under Abraham Lincoln. And one of the things that happened under Abraham Lincoln um, was the, the uh, funding of the USDA. So they switched over the, the, from the patent office to the USDA, this giving away of free seed. And so you just get free seed in the mail. Isn't that a lovely, a lovely idea? So 15 years after it was established, a third of the USDA budget was devoted to giving away free seed to farmers. At the same time, you know, more and more people were coming um, over and, and colonizing, and there were seed companies that began to form. They ran into some challenges, and one of the significant challenges was, you know, nobody bought their seeds because the government was giving away seeds for free to farmers. And so they established a lobby to try to get Congress to stop sending seeds for free. And so they formed the American Seed Trade Association. And so it was all sorts of private seed companies, nascent seed companies getting together, lobbying, you know, to stop these, this free seed program. Uh, they were not successful until 1924, but in 1924, this free seed program was, was finally terminated. So there's a lot happening around the turn of the last century. Um, this, you know, the free seeds, they stopped being given out. Um, there was a new look at Mendel. Mendel's work had kind of gotten put on the back burner, um, but it was, it was kind of, people were starting to look at uh, the uh, Mendel's work again. And this led to the beginning of the hybridization of corn. And with hybridization, um, we also have land grant colleges that have started, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Most folks here are probably very familiar with their local extension office. But there were some built-in protections for those who were working on this hybridization, and corn was one of the first things. There was some protection for them uh, in terms of, you know, copyrights and patents and things. So that, that, that you know, it couldn't be privatized. There were some built-in protections to keep it in the public. So let's go back a little bit um, to 1862, uh, Lincoln signed the Morrill Act, and this was what started um, land grant colleges. And so just it kind of interesting with the history of land grant colleges, you know, land was appropriated by the federal government from indigenous folks and held on to, and that land was then sold to individual states, and the states could then sell that land to raise money to start a college, an agricultural and mechanical college. Um, there were three things. It was, it was to uh, disseminate information out to farmers, but it was, and, and, and um, you know, the, uh, the mechanical, uh, you know, technology, but also it was to raise a militia. And that's why there is an ROTC program at every land grant college in the United States. That's kind of the history of that. 
And so the land grant colleges are where this hybridization research was taking place. One more thing that's important to think about in the beginning of the last century is copyright laws and patent laws. They started changing in around 1923 from the way that they'd ever been before. And so that's gonna have an effect on a lot of things. That started to change in 1923, but in 1923, still, anybody could uh, exchange seeds. Seeds were, you know, they weren't something that could be patented. Um, they belonged to all of us, they belonged to the earth, and anybody could grow seed, they could save seed, they could give seed away, they could, you know, their seeds were not patentable. So a patent is an, you know, it refers to an invention. A patent refers to a solution to a technological problem. It refers to a product or a process. Um, but it doesn't refer to seeds and it doesn't refer to plants. You know, how could that possibly be patented? But we do see in 1930, um, the first patent act, the Plant Patent Act, and this, there was a lot happening with Luther Burbank out in California. Um, he, was, he was creating all sorts of new plants and varieties. Um, the very first thing that had a patent on it was, uh, I think it was a rose. And the patent pro, the Plant Patent Act referred only at that time to asexual reproduction. So any kind of, uh, you know, any, any kind of plant that could be patented, it was only referring to cuttings or layering or budding or grafting. So it was asexual reproduction. It didn't have to do anything with seeds. So again, everybody can save seeds. Everybody can share seeds in 1930. And for the next 40 years, uh, that remained true. And that takes us up to 1970. And we have the Plant Variety Protection Act in 1970. And this is the first time that seeds, certain seeds, can be patented. It's called, the, you'll see a PVP, that's the abbreviation Plant Variety Protection, PVP. Didn't apply to all seeds, there were just certain seeds it applied to. And with PVP, farmers could still save their own seed. They just couldn't sell that seed, um, you know, or, or, or do anything with it to, to create money in that way, but they could, they could save the seed that had a PVP patent on it still in 1970. In 1980, this is when, this is kind of when it all begins is 1980. And so in 1980, this case went to the Supreme Court and they determined that anything that is alive can be patented. Anything under the sun can be patented. And you know, I'm just gonna real quick here. I can't see my chat box, Brooke. So, um, Okay, you can just kind of let me know. I'm going to keep going here. Yeah, keep going. We're, we got the chat. We got the questions in a separate file here for the end. And Brooke, is my screen okay? So just my, okay, great. You're great. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so here we go. We're getting deeper and deeper. In 1986, this is really important. Um, we started getting into biotechnology in 1980, and that's when they decided, you know what, these little traits and things that y'all are coming up with in biotech, um, they can be, in fact, patented. And so there started to be some concern with all this biotechnology. Uh, gee, do we need to be looking at the safety of some of these things? And so they came up with a coordinated framework for the regulation of biotechnology. And what they determined, this was, remember in 1986, we had a very pro-business um, government. And uh, they, what they decided was, we don't need new laws for this, this emerging biotechnology. The existing laws that we have are enough to provide safety. Existing statutes are sufficient. And um, they codified that even more in 1992. And what they said was, and I'll read this, genetic material and the intended expression of product or products in food derived from genetically modified crops. This is important. So, it's the, we have laws that are in effect for food additives in food, and we're gonna treat these new traits as a food additive, and therefore we'll use our existing food additive regulation. And um, they will be generally recognized as safe at the producer's determination. So this is the fox guarding the hen house with this new uh, new traits in biotechnology. So when, when, for example, and you know, Monsanto has often gotten um, 
a bad rap and gotten picked on, of course, they're, they were bought out now by Bayer, but uh, we heard a lot about Monsanto. And so, for example, it would be Monsanto that would determine the safety of a new genetic uh, trait that, that Monsanto had produced. And that's where we're at with, in uh, 1992. So this is just sort of important moments in what has happened with um, seed patenting. So we had the Plant Patents Act in 1930, the PDP in 1970. In 1980, um, the Supreme Court ruling that allowed genetics in a plant to be patented. And then in 1986, the determination that no new laws were needed for biotechnology. And then in 2000, the utility patent protection is extended to plants. And so those, that's when now traits can be patented. And an example that I you know, used for a long time in my seed uh, teaching was there, that there's a specific type of drought tolerance in corn um, that Monsanto owned the trait to. And of course, Bayer, uh, when they bought out Monsanto, then um, inherited this. So taking this to an extreme, one could, could hypothetically say that um, somebody might decide to patent uh, the color red in tomatoes. You know, that's, that's, that's what this is. So I'm gonna share some statistics with you now. And I mentioned at the beginning, um, it's, a, it's really a moving target. And that's because uh, people are selling back and forth of patents to trade. Um, Companies are buying each other out at a record, uh, at a, at a record, um, record speed. In 1980, you know, when the Chakrabarty case happened, that's when big companies started to buy out all those small seed companies in order to secure and patent the traits in those small seed companies. And that's when all of our varieties um, started really, really crumbling. And the big tech companies were putting, you know, the agri uh, tech corporations were putting their money and research into you know five or six different um, types of corn, for example. They owned the patents to maybe you know several hundred kinds of corn, but they were putting their research and energy and money into four or five different um, varieties of corn, and then mass producing them you know into a monoculture. So in 2011, if you want to just look at this pie chart, this is where we were at you know about 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, Monsanto owned 26% of all commercial seed. DuPont Pioneer owned 18%. Um, if you look, three companies, 10 years ago, three companies owned about half of the global commercial seed. Look at just the next year, what happens to this chart now. So we're starting to see this massive consolidation. So in 2012, three companies control 72% almost three fourths of the seed, the commercial seed in the world. So you can see that uh, DuPont owns 32, Monsanto 30, Syngenta 10. And then in 2018, we started to see a lot more consolidation and change. Dow and DuPont merged, and then they divided into three companies that includes Corteva. Chem China acquired Syngenta, Bayer acquired Monsanto, but then Bayer Seeds were sold to BASF. So these four firms now control approximately 60% uh, of the proprietary seed in the world. You, they just, you know, there's big, big gobbling here of, of all the smaller companies. So what I'd like to show you is, you know, Let's say that the, the commercial uh, world seed market was, and this again was 2012, I need to update these statistics. Let's say it was a line that was eight feet long, a $47 billion line that was eight feet long. The US part of that, of that $47 billion was about 12 billion. So the US has a, about two feet of that eight feet. The organic and small seed companies have about a fifth of an inch. So, it's a tiny, tiny percentage of, of we out in the world working in organic seed. Another statistic to think about is that 12 plants in the world supply 75% of the food that's consumed in the world. And three of those plants are relied on by more than, uh, fit, can, can, uh, comprise 50% of the world's food, rice, wheat, and corn. So as we're heading into climate change, 
and we have you know, exponentially fewer varieties that we're dealing with, um, you can see how frightening this is. So we have a movement now for seed sovereignty and for sharing our seed, for building community, for relocalizing our seed. You know, we're relocalizing our food. We need to be relocalizing our seed. And what I like to say uh, here, and I, a lot of y'all today are probably in the same zone as I am. I'm in 6A. So y'all in Northern Kentucky are probably in that same zone. I grew up out in Denver, uh, well, near Denver, um, and my zone out in Denver was 6A also. So one of the things to think about, you know, we need to regionally adapt something. When you look at a, an agricultural zone map and you look at a seed packet and it says this will grow great in 6A, well, that's true, and it will grow in Denver, and it will grow here, but it's going to grow better in one of those places than the other. We're both 6A, but, our, you know, for so much is different than the humidity, the soil, everything is, is really different from one place to the other. So we need to really be hyper-localizing seed that's best for our area as we're heading into this climate change. It's also such an amazing, lovely way to build community. Um, and then I'd like to talk again about seed banking versus seed sharing. So uh, when you put something into seed bank, it, it, it's, um, it, it's really to, to guard against catastrophe so that you can then pull it you know, back out of that seed bank. Um, if we would lose a particular variety or something. But when you're bringing something back from a seed bank, it's coming back to a different point in the river. It's never quite the same place. And the way to keep seed alive and viable is for us to be the seed bank. And so seed sharing is, you know, every bit as important or, or even more so really than the seed bank. And then again, we want to be increasing our varieties. 97% um, approximately of all varieties have been lost. But the lovely thing is that some of them haven't been. And, you know, all the time we're hearing about, you know, some new, uh, some, some seed that they, some variety they thought was lost, and it turns up in somebody's grandpa's backyard or something, and it's brought back, you know, from 12 seeds. And we're, so we're finding some of those varieties, and that's, that's a sign of hope for us. It's also a lot of fun. It's kind of like being a little seed sleuth, you know, to bring some of this stuff back. So I'd like to talk a little bit now about what seed can we save and what does that look like? You're probably wanting to know, like, how do you do this? And for those of you who are saving some of your seed, y'all know some of this, and there's some of it that um, there's always a lot more to learn. So some seeds uh, we can save and some seeds we can't, like what's patented and what's not, and how do we know? So we have interstate, intra and interstate seed laws that govern what we are allowed to save in terms of patenting. And so there's the American Association of Seed Control Officials, it's called ASCO. And this controls, you know, um, it controls a lot of different things. It's, it's to prevent, you know, disease from going back and forth across state borders in terms of seed. Um, it also controls viability. And so there are rules about um, the percentage of viability in a particular seed packet. And every vegetable has its own viability level. For example, um, I think with peppers, to, to legally sell a package of pepper, a pepper seed, only 55% of that package has to be um, viable. The germination rate only has to be 55%. And so, and again, every, um, every vegetable has its own viability uh, rate with the seed law. Something to consider is that some seeds are just more viable than others in general, right? As some, sometimes you have to plant a whole lot of a particular thing. It's just the way, it's just the nature of that particular seed or plant. So a few years ago, uh, we started getting into seed saving and seed libraries. And y'all may remember, um, made national news, there was a library in Pennsylvania that the Pennsylvania um, uh, Agriculture, the State Agriculture uh, Association shut them down because they said, you know, you can't be, they considered it selling seeds and they weren't selling, they were giving them away. But the problem was there was no, you know, we had, they were hitting a hammer with it a plea with a hammer, there really was no law that pertained to sharing seeds like that because we've gone from, you know, sharing seeds to, to patenting and then now we have this, you know, this commercial um, seed laws. And so there was something called the Russell Amendment and it was the recommended uniform state seed law and it redefined um, non-commercial sharing. It, it, it recreated that middle level of law. States are slowly buying onto this. It provides a template for states to use 
And right now, uh, and this is growing quickly, there were five states, uh, this was two years ago, that had, that had actually changed their state seed laws to, um, to reflect the Russell Amendment. Now, most recently in Ohio, we're in the middle of rewriting our seed laws now and updating them. But our, our local uh, fellow is Chris Holtman. The last time I spoke to him, uh, and it's been a couple of years, um, Ohio doesn't, we don't have officially, we don't have the Russell Amendment, but we model the Russell Amendment. And a lot of states model the Russell Amendment. And what that means is, if you were to set up, um, you know, like a seed, a seed trade at your local library or to have a seed library in your local library, that's where a lot of folks have seed libraries, um, you wouldn't be shut down. The, the, your de local Department of Agriculture would not shut you down. They would allow it under the Russell Amendment or if your state is modeling the Russell Amendment. And I looked up the, the person for Kentucky and it looks like the, the person that you would need to talk to is Steve McMurray on your, on your end in Kentucky and ask him um, what your, the Kentucky state law is regarding um, the Russell Amendment. So that you could know in case you wanted to set up a seed library, you know, if they have kind of jumped on the bandwagon here and kind of uh, passed this really sensible law. Okay, so if you're worried about saving seed that's patented, you should know um, when you first buy seed that if it's patented, it has to say it's patented on the label. If it doesn't say it's patented, then it's, then it's not patented. Um, and you'll see this on the label. Sometimes you'll see PVP on a label, and that's that Plant Variety Protection Act. And remember, with PVP, you can save the seed. You know, it's, you just can't sell seed without, you know, getting permission from the, from the patent holder. So PVP is still okay to save. Um, if it doesn't have a patent, uh, anything about patenting on it, it's okay to save it. What's starting to happen now in organic seeds is um, they're, they're starting to register these utility patents within organic seeds. So now we're kind of running into a problem. And that's a much more restrictive level of control. Right now, not many seeds in the gardening public have this level of restriction. But we're starting to see this even in the small organic seed companies that that patenting is creeping into traits in organic seeds. So in general, right now, look on your packet when you buy it, but if it's open pollinated, if it's in the gardening catalog, you know, you're not gonna have to worry. Do check though on, you know, on the seed packet when you get it. A lot of you are familiar with the open source seed initiative. And this is something that organic seed companies, many, many signed on. Um, and it's intended to ensure that you all never patent seed. So they're selling you this seed. We're saying, look, we don't patent this seed. We're not gonna patent it. We are giving it to you freely to do what you want with, with the agreement that you never patented and that you never profit off of it. This is just, and so it, you know, it's a way to kind of keep seed in the public domain. It's, it's helping to create and maintain a seed commons. And so it's, um, it's really lovely if you can purchase your seeds from seed companies that have signed on to the open source seed initiative. And this little symbol here will be on the seed packets um, if that company has signed on to the open source seed initiative. So again, it, it, this is what it says on the inside. You know, you're not supposed to use this for commercial purposes. It's just you can save it yourself. And there's something else uh, that high mowing started in 1999. It's the Safe Seed Pledge. And it was a statement on genetic engineering. And um, 370 seed companies have signed on to this worldwide. And this is what it says, agriculture and seeds provide the basis upon which our lives depend. We must protect this foundation as a safe and genetically stable source for future generations. For the benefit of all farmers, gardeners, and consumers who want an alternative, we pledge that we do not knowingly buy or sell genetically engineered seeds or plants. There's a new initiative now, and this was, um, again, my, my mentor, Bill McDormand, is, is working with um, seed experts and, and seed folks around the United States to try to, to start a patent-free seed campaign. Again, because these patents and these, or these trade patents are starting to creep into the organ our organic seed world now. So um, 
you're going to be seeing more and more about the patent free seed campaign coming up. Let's talk just a little bit about breeding versus genetic engineering. Sometimes people say, well, you know, people have been doing genetic engineering since the beginning of time. I mean, farmers are taking one seed and they're, you know, uh, crossing it with another. What's the difference between breeding and genetic engineering? I used to like to, uh, when I think about this, when I used to be at Extension uh, at OSU about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they were doing some research in Extension um, injecting insulin into raspberries so that um, diabetics, you know, could just eat raspberries and not have to inject themselves with insulin. And so that's an example, you know, that's not a farmer. <laughs> that's not a farmer taking one kind of uh, variety of corn and, and hybridizing it. That's uh, you know, most recently we've seen um, the Arctic apple, you know, and injecting injecting shark, uh, genetic material from sharks, you know, into, into fruit. So there's a big difference between um, breeding and genetic engineering. Breeding is what farmers have done since the beginning of time. Uh, so what's the difference between open pollinated seed and hybrid seed and genetically engineered seed? So... Okay, let's go back here a little bit. Open pollinated seed. Um, it's stable seed. It's, uh, it's, it's freely, um, you, you, you save it every year and you just keep saving it and it's, you know, it's not hybridized. Um, it is stable. It has been stabilized out. Hybridized seed is called F1. It's the first generation when you take, um, you know, a variety of watermelon uh, and you cross it with another watermelon variety and then you get a hybridized seed. And something that folks sometimes think is that you can't save hybridized seed. You can absolutely save hybridized seed. It's just that you're not going to necessarily get um, the same the same seed that you think you are. You might get more genetic material from one parent or the other because it's just that first generation. They have just barely crossed, and that's called F1. Um, some of the seeds might look like that. They will. Some of them might look more like the parent. Some of them might look more like the other parent. But it's possible to take, and this is how we get new varieties, it's one of the ways, you take that hybridized seed and you keep selecting for that same trait over several generations, and you can make that become open pollinated again and stable again. So this is just a one second um, little biology lesson here, botany lesson. So um, this is an F1 generation here. And you, you take, uh, two homozygous parents and you cross it and in uh, for two or three generations. Now, when you get down to the seventh or eighth generation and you keep selecting for that trait that you want and only saving that seed from that the trait that you want, this is, I'm making this much simpler than it really is, um, but you can then get down to where it's a stable, um, stable seed again. And this is how we get these new, these new seeds. And they, uh, for example, well, I'll show you at the end. There's, there's a, a watermelon that I'll show you. That's, you know, it's a brand new, it's stable now. It's no longer considered a hybridized seed. It is its own stable variety because they took it, they crossed it, and they stabilized it out to the seventh or eighth generation. Okay. Let's see. Is that? There we go. So open pollinated seed. It's regionally adapted. It's stable. Hybridized seed is not necessarily, it's, it's what works best over the, the most parts of the country. And it's, it's very uniform, and this is why it's best for shipping and everything. Um, but it's kind of a one-size-fits-all. It's not, it's not regionalized like our open pollinated. Or the, look at that variety there in open pollinated compared to a hybridized ear of corn. OK, I talked about this a little bit ago. Um, no seeds have 100% germination rates in, in nature. They just don't. And so seed companies are allowed to sell that minimum germination rate that I talked about. And one of the easiest ways, first of all, you can do this with your own seed when you're saving your own seed and not buying it anymore or not buying it as much from companies. But um, I used to, you know, I'd get 10 packets of seeds for a dollar from, say, Dollar General or something. Because, oh my gosh, look at this cheap seed. Well, it's cheap for a reason. It's either old, it hasn't been stored properly, or it has that minimum germination rate. So it really behooves you just in terms of your saving your pennies to buy good seed from reputable companies that are going to put in 
you know, to the best of their knowledge, 100% germination rate and not that minimum germination rate that they're allowed to do through that interstate seed law. But in any case, it always depends on how seed has been stored, um, that germination rate. So go ahead and, you know, get, buy your seed, but if you either plant it more thickly or just go ahead and test it before you plant. And it's, it's a fun thing to do with your kids. You remember in third grade, I mean, you put 10 seeds in a row on a piece of wet uh, paper towel and you roll it up and you put it in a plastic baggie with the, with the air open so it's, you know, not sealed. And then you open it up five or six, you make sure it stays wet and you open it up five or six days later and you see how many of those seeds germinated. And if you have 10, ear, 10 uh, beans in there and eight of those beans sprouted, well, then you have an 80% germination rate, you know. Um, when germination rates are being tested on a, on a large scale, they'll do, you know, 100 seeds at a time. So you get a little bit more accurate rate, but you can do this at home with 10 seeds. So it's not bad if you had seed that has a low germination rate, you just, you just plant more of it, you know. Okay, so pollination. We really need to know about pollination if um, we're going to understand how to save seeds. So I'm going to try to get, let's see, just real quick. Well, that's all right. I'm just going to, I'll rely on you, Brooke, to keep me on time. I'm just going to try to pull up my phone or my clock. Um, so there, in nature, there are perfect flowers and imperfect flowers. And in a perfect flower, they have both male and female parts. Some perfect flowers are selfers and some perfect flowers are crossers. So inside a perfect flower, there's a male and a female part. Some of those perfect flowers are self-pollinating pretty much. So tomatoes, peppers, peas, beans, and lettuce. And that's why selfers, self-pollinating perfect flowers are the easiest thing to save because pretty much you don't have to worry too much about cross-pollination because they are pollinating themselves inside the flower. Some perfect flowers are crossers. An example of that is broccoli and cabbage and kale. And so even though they have a male and a female part, they will cross over to another plant. So this, the male in this plant might cross over to the female in the other plant. Now we have imperfect flowers. And so in an imperfect flower, um, there's only a male part or a female part. And an example of that, whoops, um, need to move this, there we go. Um, corn, squash, spinach, melons, cucumbers, those are some examples. Okay, so selfers are perfect flowers and they're self-pollinating. Crossers um, could be perfect flowers or imperfect, and the cross-pollination happens between different plants. So it's a little bit tricky, isn't it? Um, and nobody said that botany was easy, right? There's a lot of uh, exceptions in botany. So here are some crossers that do have perfect flowers, but they, even though there's a male and a female inside each flower, they can't pollinate themselves. They need another, another plant. So a lot of your brassicas are like this. There are crossers that are monoecious, and that means that on the same plant, you can have a male flower, and a female flower, and a really good example of this is squash. Or there are crossers with imperfect flowers that are dioecious, and so that means two different plants. So in this case, that means you've got male asparagus plants and you've got female asparagus plants. So it's not a male and a female in the same on the same plant; they're on whole different plants. And all of this helps us to know how we need to save our seed. So the selfers are, um, you know, they're self-pollinating, self-fertilizing. You don't have to worry too much about cross-pollination. And these are very well adapted to a specific environment. And that's why they're the, the great thing to start off with to save seed. Crossers, you know, you have to think about cross-pollination and you have to find ways to, to prevent that cross-pollination from happening, which I'll talk about. So crossers are a mixture of genes from two different parents and they can adapt to changing environments. So here's the different kinds of ways that plants get pollinated. Self-pollinating, right? We talked about that. Wind pollinated, great example, that's corn. Um, insect pollination or other kinds of pollinators, or sometimes things are self and insect pollinated. And a good example of this is um, 
I love this example, tomatoes, they're self-pollinating. You don't really have to worry too much about them cross-pollinating, but the pollen inside a tomato flower is very sticky and it's really hard for that pollen to drop. Um, and so bumblebees love, they're very attracted to tomato flowers and they come up and they do something called sonication and they're, you know, they're, they're buzzing, they're buzzing right next and they're, that, that, um, that vibration knocks that pollen off and down into the, into the flower. And so um, bumblebees help with pollination with tomatoes, even though they're self-pollinating. I think that's just such a lovely thing to think about. Well, I love that photo, Beth. I just wanna uh, chime in here. You have five more minutes until the start of Q&A. Great, okay, I'll zip through this and thanks, Brooke. I told you it's really hard to get through this in just an hour. So this is a list, um, you know, you can, and I, you can get this anywhere, but it shows you if something is self-pollinating or insect pollinating. Okay, how do we control pollination? It's great to know what families your vegetables are in. So species can't cross, but varieties within species can. Just some quick examples. Um, beets and chard can cross the same species, but beets and quinoa can't. They're the same family, but not the same species. Okay, I'm gonna, here's, Again, you folks have access to this, um, these slides afterwards, and so I won't spend much time on this. There's the different crop families here. And um, with cross-pollination, do you need to worry about it? If you're selling a, you know, if you're selling seed, you certainly need to worry about this. If you're just saving it for yourself from year to year and don't really worry, maybe there's not a, not a need to worry about cross-pollination. Okay, a way to uh, prevent cross-pollination is by distance. So if you had two different kinds of squash, you could plant them really, really far apart. That list I just gave you shows you how far apart to prevent that insect or wind pollination. So you can isolate by space, by distance, by timing. They do this a lot with corn. You plant things um, you know, uh, two or three weeks apart so that it, it's not gonna be um, uh, pollinating at the same time. You can use pollination cages. And again, this helps to keep the insects out so that you don't have to worry about cross-pollination. You, you make sure they get pollinated and then you put that cage on so that it doesn't uh, cross-pollinate. Then we have um, blossom bags and you, this covers the individual flower. And I'll just show you really quickly. You can um, hand pollinate, which is really fun to do with your kids. And you, you, know, you peel back um, the parts of the female flower, you take the part of the male flower and you just use it almost like a Q-tip and you go ahead and hand pollinate that as it demonstrated here. But then when you do that, you wanna close it shut so that nothing else can get in there. And then you wanna um, mark it so that you know which, which flower you're trying to save and then you're gonna get true seed here. Okay. So how do we, um, how do we know, how do we select our seeds? First, you maintain a healthy variety. Um, you can start right when you're starting your seedlings and just note to not save, you know, this, this, the small seeds, these little plants that don't look quite as good, rip them out right from the beginning and don't even, don't even let them grow higher. It's hard to do at this time of year because you want to save every single thing, but you can start with um, selection right at the seeding, seedling stage. Field selection um, at harvest time, you know, only save that, that, that very best seed. Um, and then natural selection, there's a lot of reasons that, that this could be caused, but you know, look at that and see which plant you wanna save your seed from. And then you can go ahead and, and um, intentionally cross things. And here's an example of painted mountain corn. Um, this is a breeder named Dave Christensen. He crossed 71 different kinds of corn to get this beautiful uh, population cross. Um, this is another uh, seed breeder, Alan Kapuler, and he created, um, it's a, so a Grex is the same, thing is a land race and it's when you have a genetically stable localized seed and so every year when he plants this grex this is the kind of diversity he gets but it's stabilized out and this is the ways he crossed it by crossing these three different um, kinds of beets over time and he stabilized it out and again um, you can make some intentional crosses so black diamond in early Canada you can cross that um, and then that became my things here there we go that became the sweet Dakota rose and now that's its own stable seed. Okay, diversity equals resilience. That's really what we're about here. As we head into really uncertain times, we need uh, seed resilience, we need seed diversity. And what I'd like to say to you is, um, 
you know, all of this could sound complicated, but also anybody can save seed and you just need to do it and just try it. But it'll just bring you so much joy. So just start. Um, and let's all work towards seed sovereignty. And I didn't get to talk about winnowing or storage, but um, so seed screens, once you save your seeds, you need to, admit, you know, with there's dry harvesting and wet harvesting and with dry harvesting, you know, like beans or something like that or corn, you need to, um, you know, run it, run it across a seed screen and those are sold by Fedco. And then you also want to um, keep your seeds in the refrigerator inside a plastic bag. So they need to, they need to not get wet, but they need to not get too dry. And I keep mine in the fridge because it's a, it's a perfect temperature uh, to really uh, help with that genetic uh, or the germination. These are three books I would recommend. Um, the book on the right is Heirloom Seeds and Their Keepers. Virginia Nazarene is an anthropologist out of the University of Georgia, and she writes beautifully about cultural memory and the memories that we store in our seeds. And they, help, they hold all memory. Every seed holds all memory of the universe, but it's also that memory of, of, our, of our, you know, our grandparents and the seed that they saved and those stories behind that seed. Okay, uh, here's some resources. Richmond Gross is um, out of Oakland, California, or Richmond, which is right in the north of Oakland, and, and they have tons of information about how to start a seed library. And then these two videos are really great, and it really explains the importance of actually purchasing organic grown seed to grow organic vegetables. So we can take seed and grow things organically, but unless it's organic seed, um, it's, it's not going to be completely ideal. Uh, a couple of great movies, The Un a Seed, The Untold Story, and Open Sesame, The Story of Seeds. Two great movies, and I think they're just on Netflix. Um, here's some more. Hudson Valley Seed Shed and the Native American Seed Library, they're, they're doing a lot of work with indigenous seed and um, bringing back that indigenous seed and then getting it back out to indigenous folks who, who um, you know, lost that seed over time. The National Heirloom Expo um, in Santa Rosa, California, if we ever get a chance, it's the most fun thing in the world to go to, uh, to Seed Expo. Uh, Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, Native Seed Search, and Seed Savers Exchange are all really wonderful organizations to support that are really uh, doing this important work. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now and pull up my chat. Or actually, uh, Brooke, can you folks just start? Yeah, yeah, we, have, we got a few questions ready to go. Thank you so much for that. Your photos are just amazing there. And obviously, you could talk to with us for like five days about all this information. You really packed it into that 50 minutes. So, um, First, right off of that, um, when you're when you're initially processing seeds, is there any um, is there any washing that is needed or um, drying extra steps for drying? Just very technical on that. Sure. Yeah. And so I, I just like to talk about wet processing and dry processing. And any dry processing is just I mean just think of a seed that's already dry. I mean lettuce seeds, you know, uh, beans, corn. Just make sure they're completely dry, and then let them dry out even more than you think you need to. Um, that's dry processing before you store them. Wet processing is uh, uh, things like tomatoes, um, cucumbers, sometimes peppers. Peppers can go either way. With wet processing, a, a great trick, particularly with tomatoes, is to squeeze the squeeze the tomato seed out, and you're going to have it's really gelatinous, right? And that gelatinous uh, stuff around the seeds it actually prevents germination. Um, and so what you do is you put it in a glass of water, put that gooey tomato seed in a glass of water and let it sit there for four or five days. And um, it's not gonna get that smelly really at all, um, but it's gonna start to ferment a little bit and that fermentation process um, really increases your germination. And it also prevents, um, you know, it prevents uh, disease from happening. And the, the most wonderful thing too, is that the, um, the viable seed will drop down to the bottom of the glass over four or five days. And the seed that's still on the top it doesn't have that germplasm in it. And so you know already, that's a way that you can increase your germination rate is just by not taking that seed. So do that and then you want to um, you know, carefully drain the water off and then spread that seed out on a seed screen. I like to just use you know, an old piece of screen and um, let it completely dry and then you could save it. Great, fantastic. Um, so we have a question. Uh, have you been saving a specific variety or crop from your own garden that you're really excited about? Do you what what seed saving practices do you use? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'll just say that I got into seed saving uh, because I wanted to save beets because beets are my favorite thing in the world. 
And it turns out that beets are biennial and they're pretty tricky to save. And so I don't save my own beet seed or carrot seed, for example, because um, you can do it, but you have to bring the beet in the house and, and keep it in, in a pot over, over winter and then set it and then replant that same beet, you know, in the spring. there's a lot to it. Um, but I always, I save, you know, I started saving uh, the self-pollinating stuff that a lot of us maybe already do. So tomatoes, peppers, you know, my lettuces, um, all those kinds of things flowers and I do I do collect seed uh, which you know there was a, a question about this I do um, in areas I'm allowed to you know collect um, forage seed and to, to really try to increase I have a prairie strip that I plant and so you know to increase that kind of seed I collect those seeds and save them. Mm -hmm. Wonderful all right um, a question from Ray here um, she's curious whether you think it was a good or bad thing good being that more seeds to more people oh it was in the context of um, when the U.S. Postal Service and USDA were sending out free seeds. So it was in, in context of that. Um, we're curious if you thought it was a good thing or a bad thing that this was happening. Good being that more seeds were going to more people at no cost, but bad that it was part of the land colonization to distribute European seeds to primarily then white farmers. So this is another huge conversation that has, has really uh, come to the forefront in the last few years. And it's, it's interesting, I mean, when we talk about, um, you know, the, the, the Black Farming and the Reparations Act, I, you know, it's, it's complicated too, because, you know, all of that land was appropriated. So it is a very complicated conversation. I appreciate that question. Yeah, again, we can talk for a, a day <laughs> on this. Um, okay. Can you speak about the importance of folks um, working to develop new varieties to patent for open source use and effort to preserve some varieties for the public domain? So efforts, um, how important is it that we all work towards developing the new varieties or maintaining existing varieties for the public domain? So I, so first of all, it's, uh, I, I see that as kind of a two part question. It's, it's very important that we try to increase um, genetic variety as much as we can. You know, we've lost so much genetic material. So uh, this happened in just quickly, in, you know, uh, with the corn crop, I think it was 1972. There was a, a trait in those five major kinds of corn around at the time, um, and it uh, was susceptible to a virus and the whole corn crop was wiped out. And so we really need to be increasing this genetic diversity. And I would argue that we really need to be keeping it out of the patenting, um, you know, by these huge uh, agrochemical corporations as much as we can. Um, you know, you've heard of Vandana Shiva and, you know, the mass suicide rates in with Indian farmers because, you know, they have, they're not allowed, they have to repurchase that seed every year. And with climate change, you know, the, you know, they, they get a drought and they lose their whole crop and then they don't have enough money to purchase the seed next year and they get into this horrible spiral. And so we need to have access to our own seed. Mm -hmm. So on that note, what role, um, in your experience, what role do re these regional seed swaps and seed sharing events uh, play in the movement towards growing seed sovereignty? Well, I think, I think there's a lot of different answers to that. One is, you know, community building. So, so you, know, you can be on completely separate sides of the spectrum and boy, are there separate sides of the political spectrum right now. But, you know, you can, you can save seed together and you can say, hey, can I have some of your seed or here's some of mine? And it's a great way to build community, which is important. Um, it's, it's really very important in regionalizing, you know, localizing our seeds. So we need to find those carrots that grow best right in our area um, that are stable for our area because that's what's gonna help us with climate change, so. Mm -hmm. Where, I guess, um, where have you seen really good examples of those networks growing? What are some like key indicators that you've seen um, emerging out of those networks where there's a very strong regionalized seed source? Um, well, with Baker Creek seed, there's a lot of uh, movement in Missouri around that. Uh, I see it in California. Um, I think, well, I, I think from what I was talking with y'all uh, down in Kentucky, there's some good work being done in this area. So I think it's little pockets right now that are gonna grow and grow and grow. There's a lot of um, seed stability and variety up in Vermont, a lot of small seed companies up there. Um, but this really needs to be on, you know, a neighbor to neighbor level. And just, you know, the, the, the more microcosm we can make this, the better in terms of stabilizing our seed and then, you know, creating that genetic variety. Great. Um, so if folks have any final questions for Beth, go ahead and drop them in the chat. We're almost at the end of our time here. Um, let me 
I, I want to ask you a bit about um, considerations for seed storage, um, both short term and long term and sort of like what's ideal and what do you do in the meantime before you have a whole, you know, like climate controlled chamber set up that kind of thing. Um, what should what should we be considering there. Sure. Well, I, I think, again, you know, when I talk about, you know, what I do is I put my seeds in the, in the refrigerator and have a climate control room or anything. Before I knew how to save seeds, I was still saving seeds before I knew how to save seed. And I was just leaving it in my garage or I was just leaving it, you know, on my sideboard in my, in my dining room, you know, and it still worked. Um, so there's ideal ways and then there's ways that still work. And so I would say, really, don't be afraid of that. Just do it. Um, so... I, the important thing is not to let it get too dried out and then not, and then to make sure it's dry enough, you know, when you save it so that um, you don't run into mold and humidity and things. Yeah. And so there's some specific questions about what, what exact temperature, and it's my understanding that it sort of varies depending on what your, your seed is, but there's a, an optimal range there. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, again, um, I think for the home grower, um, if you put it in a cool garage or so, you know, it, it, you can freeze it um, and bring it back out. That's what's happening in a seed bank. But if, if you can try to keep it under about 40 degrees, you know, around um, in between 30 and 40 degrees, that, that's, that's ideal for a lot of vegetable seed. Mm -hmm. that, a lot of growers that have a, a whole separate, just little fridge for it um, and put it in those. Mm -hmm. um, that seed to seed book that you have, I think also indicates the temperatures for seed saving. Um, that seed to seed book that you recommended, that's a great one. All right, um, well, thank you all. Um, there are a couple more chats coming in, but no questions. So um, I just wanna say that thank you so much. Um, you shared so much with us. Um, do you have any parting words, final comments? Well, I would just really encourage you. I think that seed saving is all about joy. I think we need to think about uh, a resilience uh, mindset of joy rather than fear as we move forward. And, um, and just know that as a community, we can do anything. And um, so I would just really encourage you to try to start saving seed. It's just, it's just the most satisfying thing in the world to do, even just as a hobby. Um, and I will be happy to um, put very quickly my, um, in the chat, I'll put my uh, email in case you want to contact me and have a question. Yeah, Beth has been so generous with her time. Um, we promised to try to get her back down here for a longer session with us when we can all be in person. It'd be great fun. Uh, her email is there in the chat, so feel free to reach out to her um, with follow-up questions or with us and we'll get them to her. Um, Beth, thank you so much and we wish you all the best for the rest of the day, okay? Thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks everyone. Bye.